LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Steve Taylor, author of several best-selling books on psychology and spirituality, including Waking from Sleep, The Fall, Out of the Darkness and his latest book, Back to Sanity. Have you ever thought that there might be something wrong with human beings, even that we might be slightly insane? Why is it that so many human beings are filled with a restless discontent and an insatiable desire for material goods, status and power? Why is it that human history has been filled with endless conflict, oppression and inequality? In Back to Sanity, Steve Taylor shows that we do suffer from a psychological disorder which he refers to as humania or ego madness. This disorder is so close to us that we don't realise it's there but it's the root cause of all our dysfunctional behaviour, both as individuals and as a species. This book explains the characteristics of humania, where it stems from, and how it leads to the madness of materialism, status-seeking, warfare, inequality, and other symptoms of our insanity. But equally importantly, Back to Sanity shows how we can heal this mental disorder and allow the fleeting moments of harmony that we all experience from time to time to become our permanent state of being. Hello and welcome Steve Taylor and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's a pleasure, it's great to be here. Now Steve, um, today we're going to chat about uh, your recent book uh, Back to Sanity, uh, subtitle is Healing the Madness of Our Minds Mm -hmm. and perhaps you could get us started by giving us an overview um, of the the central thesis which is basically that uh, collectively as a species, humanity is suffering, suffering um, from basically a form of mental illness or madness. That's right. I think I think the the mental disorder is so normal to us that we can't really view it objectively, and we don't actually realise that it's there. So in the book, I try to take the perspective of an alien being who was sent to the Earth to write an anthropological study of human beings. So I try to sort of view human ra- the human race from the outside from an objective standpoint. And I think if you do that, then you have to reach the conclusion that there is something seriously wrong with human beings. On the one hand, it's if you look back at human history, and nobody can look back at human history without coming to the conclusion that human beings suffer from some kind of psychological disorder and that we're slightly insane or even largely insane. You know, if you look back at the whole of the... You know, human history is an endless catalogue of warfare, is an endless saga of constant conflict, constant oppression, the oppression of women, the oppression of different castes, conflict between different groups and so forth, then sexual repression, monotheistic religion. I think all, the, all of these are signs of you know, uh, something that's some, something slightly amiss with human beings. Yes, now this basically is something, the background to all of this is something that you've covered in great detail in an earlier book of yours called The Fall. Um, But to briefly touch on that material, um, because you do uh, come back to it somewhat in in Back to Sanity, is you're comparing most of modern society, put that in in quotes, with the indigenous uh, peoples of the earth, such that they're still remaining. Mm -hmm. And that they're the same as us. We're all human beings, but they're different And in comparing and contrasting the two different outlooks, the two different ways of being in the world, that it becomes increasingly clear that we have lost or forgotten something very important from our past. That's right. Yeah, I think the essential difference between modern human beings and prehistoric peoples and many indigenous peoples, or at least indigenous peoples as they were before, before their cultures were 
you know, uh, disrupted or destroyed by colonial contact. Then the essential difference is that they had a, a powerful sense of connection to nature and to the, the whole cosmos. They seem to be less individualistic in the sense that they were less separate from their environments. What characterizes modern human beings, and by modern, I don't just mean like 20th, 21st century human beings, I mean human beings for the last few centuries, possibly the last few millennia, what characterizes us is a strong sense of separateness. You know, we experience ourselves as entities which exist, which dwell inside our own mental space. And there's a duality between us and the world out there. You know, we, we experience a, a sense of separateness. We are bounded by our egos, and therefore we experience a sense of, um, well, a sense of separateness, ego separateness, as I call it, but also ego isolation, the sense that we are apart from the world. I think that sense of disconnection, that sense of separation, is one of the root causes of so much um, discord and so much, um, so much conflict and disharmony which fills human history and which still fills our lives as individuals. Yes, and this affects not only our relationships with each other on a sort of interpersonal level, but globally between tribes, nations, um, all sorts of power blocks, the way we've divided ourselves up along different lines. It mm -hmm. affects our relationship to the natural world, you know, the rest of creation, which indigenous people understand we're, you know, an intrinsic part of. And this yeah. even extends down, this division even extends down into ourselves, where we have this like almost a schizophrenic split in that, you know, we find it difficult to, to live even with ourselves. It's at every strata, mm. there seems to be this, the divide seems to manifest itself. Mm, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it manifests itself in the divide between the mind and the body. You know, this mm -hmm. sense, the sense that many people have that they are an ego inhabiting this vehicle, which we call the body. And that, that sense of inhabiting the body rather than being part, part of the body as an integrated unit. I think that's the source of sexual repression too. I mean, one of the one of the insane characteristics of human beings throughout history, or the last few, few thousand years of history, has been this uh, sense that somehow sex and somehow the body itself are unclean. You know, there's something that we need to separate ourselves from and try to overcome, try to transcend. So we try to we repress sexual desires, completely healthy and natural sexual desires. And we try to somehow overcome them, you know, through celibacy or through self-control. And sexual desires become part of a something unclean, you know, something dirty or, you know, something perverted. And, and the, you know, you can still see that in so many societies around the world, you know, in the Middle East, where there's a very hostile and ambivalent attitude towards sex. And I, and I think that's also part of the, um, it's one of the root causes of, the oppression of women too, because women, you know, they they cause sexual desires to manifest themselves in men, and therefore, since sexual desires are seen as something unclean that we should overcome, then that extends to women too. They're seen as something unclean and a kind of enemy as well. Yes, and there's a lot of natural sort of dualities in the world and in the universe, and we've kind of that particular one, the male-female one, which. You know, it's meant to be a complementary relationship has been turned into another division, hasn't it really? That's right, yeah. And I think it's interesting that in many societies, um, societies which are much more healthy than modern societies, I'm talking about indigenous societies or prehistoric societies, in those societies, um, the division between men and women was much more vague. You know, the, the borderline between the, the different genders, the gender roles, and even the characteristics of the different genders was much more blurred. You know, it's, it's only in really, particularly I'm, th I'm thinking of, you can see this really clearly in Middle Eastern societies where the, you know, there's such a massive division between the role of women, the role of men. You know, the, the role of women is mainly to, you know, is mainly within the house, whereas the role of men is outdoors. You know, so women are indoors, literally, in, you know, in countries like Saudi Arabia, where women are almost imprisoned in their own houses. Whereas men, their domain is the outside world. And it manifests itself in childcare, you know, the woman's role is to look after the children, the man's role is to work. But in, in prehistoric societies and in many indigenous societies, 
you know, gender roles were much more blurred. Men did a lot of childcare. They shared a lot of childcare. Even their, you know, their economic roles were, were, were merged as well. So, so really, that division, that extreme division between male and female, is also a symptom of our insanity. Um, one of the ways, uh, well, there are many ways that we attempt to deal with this division and this um, disconnect. And in the modern world, it takes the form of you know, materialism and all, mm. all, all forms of distractions that we have for ourselves. You know, we, we always have to be doing something. We can't sit still. We're, I think, as you say in the book, we're human doings. We're not really human beings. And all of which, uh, and I'm glad to say that increasing numbers of people are, are coming to this realization. Like, all of this is not making us happy. It is not filling the void. Yeah, that, that's right. I think materialism is really also materialism together with a desire to gain status and to gain power. They're really an attempt to to increase our sense of significance and a desire to gain completeness as well. I think one, one of the characteristics of the, of the separate ego is that it generates a sense of insufficiency and incompleteness. So, so we're always looking for something to allay that sense of incompleteness, that sense of insignificance. And, you know, and the closest things to hand are, are often material goods or you know, the attempt to gain status or wealth by becoming a, a powerful person. You're really trying to transcend that sense of, you know, the fundamental sense of incompleteness and insignificance which goes with the separate ego. I've often thought, actually, that our this fundamental need that we have for intimate relationships. When I say that, I don't necessarily mean sexual, but just, you know, sort of union with another being is actually part of trying to become whole as well. Because I think that I'm, I subscribe to, when we look at the interconnectedness of things, I do subscribe to certainly the possibility of the notion that there is a, a universal consciousness. And I think that even that desire to, as I say, to have intimate relationships could stem from this sense of incompleteness. I think it does with, particularly with human beings, I think even though we experience a sense of separateness, it's easy to also sense a sense of bondedness, to to transcend that separateness through human contact, or even contact with animals, or contact with nature. Those are the the most, um, well, the easiest ways in which we can gain a sense of bondedness, in which we can transcend separation. And I think, yeah, I think you're right with union, sexual union, or union through love, or union through contact with nature, the real moments when, even if it's, you know, fairly momentarily, the real moments in which we can transcend separateness and gain a sense of the wholeness from which we originally came. And it, it always feels natural in those moments. They always feel somehow natural and right, because in some sense, you know, that's the place where we came from, that, that the unmanifest wholeness was uh, our origin as human beings. Now, I've seen people in all sorts of places from queues in a bank to the waiting room at the dentist to the bus stop, all uh, sort of uneasy to a degree that seemed unnatural. Well, maybe you'd say the person waiting to see the dentist had every reason to be uneasy, but (laughs) I noticed that people have real problems doing nothing. And because what happens is and you write about this obviously in the book the dangers of of doing nothing for many people is that it it opens up their their inner self and they start to think and they experience this disconnectedness this void that we've been discussing in mm-hmm. quite a pronounced way and that has to be avoided at all costs hence filling the day with noise and activity mm. yeah you're right it's a, it's a good observation yeah, but I think the fundamental problem is that there is a, a discord in our own minds. I sometimes compare it to, you know, imagine there's a, a teenager, or say a young girl, and her parents are arguing all the time in the house. There's a very discordant relationship between the parents, and the house is full of, you know, pent-up uh, discord and aggression. So she spends all the time outside. You know, she never goes home. Maybe she go home, goes home to sleep and maybe for mealtimes. But she makes an attempt to stay outside as much as she can. And it's similar with our own minds, because our own minds are full of discord, they're full of restless thought chatter, you know, the the uncontrollable, involuntary chattering about what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, memories from the past. And that, that, you know, sometimes daydreams can be quite pleasant, 
in a, in a kind of reverie, a lazy reverie on a Sunday afternoon. Daydreams can be quite nice then, but usually thought chatter, it creates a sense of disturbance inside us. And also it creates negative feelings because often we tend to dwell on anxious thoughts about the future or, you know, negative thoughts about the past. So usually whenever we spend too much time in our own minds, we start to feel a, a tinge of depression or a slight anxiety. And therefore, this impulse to escape our own minds, to go out of our own minds occurs. And so we use distractions like TV or you know, reading newspapers or, or activities that don't really need to be done. We may work more hours than we need to. We may do household chores that don't really need to be done. All of it to escape this restless discord inside our own minds. However, as you point out in Back to Sanity, that this undercurrent of dissatisfaction is not coming from outside of us. It comes from within. Mm -hmm. And it's only what, you know, the, the popular parlance is doing the inner work. It's only going in and dealing with that that's going to... Um, eradicate the problem in the long term that's true although you know there are certain activities or in certain environments which we can expose ourselves to which can help to heal the discord like for example i've mentioned nature nature has a naturally healing effect it naturally calms our minds and it naturally creates a sense of connection which overcomes our separation uh, and also Activities such as altruism, altruistic activities where we serve other people, acts of kindness towards other people, they also help to transcend our separateness. You know, they, they create a bond between us, us and other people. But also, yeah, I think you're probably right. Most importantly, you know, we have to take our own developmental steps towards healing the discord inside ourselves. We have to practice certain techniques and certain lifestyle guidelines, you could call them, to try to heal the discord inside our minds. One of the major problems I see uh, in this, this area, and there's a lot of tension that people experience when they attempt to make changes, is that we we do have um, an economic system uh, globally, more or less, but certainly in, in industrialized uh, nations, that depends on our inability to just be. Um, it's completely geared towards activity yeah. and consumption, and for, to, 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 for there to be um, quite profound change globally in the way that, that you know, the human race lives on this planet, that kind of has to be undone and rolled back. And there's obviously mm -hmm. enormous weight of history and all sorts of other things, enormous forces at play um, actively and passively to keep that from happening. It's just one of, the, mm -hmm. it's one of the big things that we sort of need to address somehow. Well, I agree. But at the same time, you have a choice. You, know, you have a choice whether you want to go along with the system. Now, I personally have never gone along with it. I've never worked more than I specifically needed to to survive. I've never worked more than three days a week in my whole life. And to do that, I've sacrificed material goods. I've never, you know, I've never engaged in the pursuit of buying unnecessary material goods. I've always lived a life of very, you know, very basic means, just so that I have time to devote to the pursuits I, I perceive as being you know, uh, interesting and valid to me as an individual. So I think you have a choice to a degree whether you want to buy into this system. There are ways in which you can, you know, mitigate its influence on you. And you, to what extent do you think that, that children are, are, they certainly seem to be freer from this ego isolation and discord than adults do? I mean, is this, is it something exclusively that we learn as we grow up, we learn how to be in the world um, or is there a degree to which the idea of a collective consciousness means that we, we can sort of be predisposed to being programmed this way? I think it's part of our, our psychological development. I think as a species, you know, humania is something that we, we naturally develop as we grow into adulthood, as we become adolescents. You know, the sense of separation develops during late childhood into adolescence and also thought chatter the restlessness inside our minds that also begins in late childhood and it, it becomes becomes fully formed in sort of adole late adolescence, you could say. So it's definitely part, it's a developmental step, uh, a developmental process, which we go through collectively, individually and collectively, most of us. But at the same time, it's definitely exacerbated by social influences. You know, as you mentioned before, we live in a society which places um, a great deal of value on material goods 
It's a very competitive society. It encourages to think individu- individualistically. It doesn't really encourage uh, a communal a communal sensibility. It doesn't really encourage. Uh, it doesn't teach us the value of connection to nature and the value of altruism and service. So th- I mean, so these social influences exacerbate the problems. They sort of exacerbate the the natural developmental stages which occur. And but I think it's true. I think childhood is the state in which we are largely free of humania. And but in a sense, you know, we can turn full circle. You know, we can sort of move through adulthood and return in some sense to the the more sane state of mind as childhood of childhood, but at the same time retain retaining some of the intellectual and practical abilities which we gain as adults. One of the things that I remember about childhood is this sense of uh, the moment in that I can't even recall conceptualizing what I'd done the previous day just a vague awareness of perhaps somewhere I'd been or something Mm -hmm. I'd done and looking forward only consisted of maybe oh well Christmas or my birthday or something or we're going to go to the beach next week but it certainly didn't rule my life and Mm -hmm. as we get older uh, we tend to live more in the past or in the future or sometimes both and you do address in the book the great habit we have of looking forward as a way of Mm. making the present bearable when actually the present is all there is. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I think so many people live their lives with one eye on the future. You know, they're obviously physically we're always in the present. We can't be anywhere but the present. But because there's a sense of dissatisfaction in the present created by the discord in our minds and possibly exacerbated by the kind of lives we lead, because there is that discontent in the present, we turn to the future and to make the present bearable, you know, we sort of deflect our attention onto the future. And therefore, you know, we focus on, you know, what we're going to do at the weekend, holidays, even vague ambitions of becoming famous or successful in the future, starting your own business, becoming a famous pop star and so forth. So, you know, you sort of, um, you end up, or many people end up living their whole lives in the future, which effectively means that you're not living at all because... As we know, the future is only an idea in your head. It's only a sort of abstraction. It doesn't really exist, which is also true of the past. So if you live your whole life in the future or the past, in effect, in effect you're not living. You're only escaping from life. Yeah, and we touched on this briefly a little earlier, but um, you then go on to project or uh, describe what happens and what is happening when you project this sense of individual ego isolation and disconnection onto the collective level and writ large it, it kind of transforms itself into societal and global oppression inequality and increasingly um, certainly in the 20th 20th and this part of the 21st century um, a huge environmental damage and this is clearly insane because we're we're undermining the ability of the, the only planet we've got to support us it's a strange kind of suicidal pathological behavior you know, it's, it's self-destructive but I mean, it's rooted. Environmental destruction, I believe, has the same basic root as um, you know, warfare, oppression, oppression of different group, social groups, and it, it, essentially, it's a desire for power and control. You know, and human beings, ever since the 16th and 17th century, there's been a, a philosophy of domination over nature. I mean, it goes right back to the Bible, actually, you know, in, in Genesis, where we are told, God tells us to have dominion over the animals and the fishes, etc. And it's that desire for control and power, you know. On the one hand, it's a desire to extract the resources of the earth, to use those resources to improve our lives, to make us more, um, you know, more wealthy and to bolster our, our sense of insecurity. And at the same time, it's a desire for power over nature, you know. In the same way that we ne- we desire power over other people, over other societies, which can lead to oppression and warfare. We desire power over nature. We, we want to be the kings of the earth. We, we, we want to make the earth into our slave. And the, we want to make all of the species into our slaves. And therefore, ultimately, that can only lead to self-destruction. And it is obviously leading to self-destruction at the moment. Whether you subscribe to the Darwinian theory of evolution, how we came to be here, and all its essential sort of nihilism that's contained in that. At its root is the notion of competition. And you set out in, in Back to Sanity how actually 
we only really get anywhere and achieve anything when we cooperate, not when we compete. But that again sort of flies in the face of you know modern Western industrial values, which is that competition is necessarily a good thing. And I have read a great deal and spent a lot of time talking to other people about how if only we could free this up to a bit of competition, we'd get a better result. So I realize it's a double-edged sword, but fundamentally that the idea that we're competitive creatures translates into this, into war and into inequality and into trying to climb over somebody else so you can get ahead. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we desire status, if we desire power, if we desire wealth, you know, there is only a certain, there's only a limited amount of these things around. So we have to compete to gain our share of them. You know, we have to sort of knock other people over in the race for power and success. And we have to sort of push other people up to one side and, you know, climb all over them to get where we want to. But I think it's nonsense. I think it's absolutely nonsensical to, to, you know, to believe in that kind of Darwinian, um, Darwinian idea that human beings are naturally competitive and naturally individualistic. I think the evidence, all the evidence actually works against that view because human beings throughout history have been cooperative. You know, we lived for 95% of our time on this planet, we've lived as hunter-gatherers. Uh, so that means in small bands of maybe up to 40 people who, who would move to different areas every few months or so. And hunter-gatherers, that tribe of 40 people would be completely egalitarian. There would be very little personal possessions. We would share all our food. Uh, there'd be no hierarchy, no leaders. And even different groups would not would not necessarily compete against each other or even be in conflict with each other. Often groups would merge with each other. Group, group, um, individuals would transfer to different groups. And you know, it's a myth that that in pre prehistoric times there was a lot of warfare and a lot of conflict. There actually wasn't. There's very little archaeological evidence for any warfare at all before about uh, six thousand years ago. Warfare becomes incredibly intense incredibly frequent during the fourth millennium bc but before then there's very little evidence evidence for it and you know even on a biological level genes do not genes are not individual units which compete against each other on every level of our biology there is you know there is constant cooperation constant collaboration and you know it's, it's, it's kind of it's a strange kind of mythology the myth of the the gene which wants to reproduce itself you know, the myth of the individual pitting his or her, usually his, his will against the forces of nature. It's a strange kind of pathological mythology, which doesn't really have any basis in fact. Now, in the second section of the book, uh, Back to Sanity, um, which you've entitled The Return to Harmony and Sanity, uh, you talk about uh, ways to transcend this. And indeed, you know, how much of this is already happening and how many people are participating in this, which, you know, is very encouraging. And you discuss a harmony of being, um, concepts such as flow and the practice of meditation. And ultimately, uh, the realization, as you mentioned earlier, that we do have a choice in all of this. And that if we're not prepared to you know, challenge ourselves uh, so that we end up with a better uh, result, if we feel that it's going to be too difficult to step outside of the materialistic paradigm, well, you know, that that's a choice. But if we actually take the step and do it, we can find that serendipity begins to happen uh, synchronicity and that ultimately that's the path to making a better world for everyone and that if we get to a certain point and i've heard other commentators say this we can get to a certain point where a critical number of people are engaged in making this change and it doesn't have to be a majority at all that we really do have a chance to sort of you know i mean heal the world sounds like this preposterously big uh sort of aspiration but we don't actually have any other choice we do have to do this if we're going to make it yeah i think so i mean i think there is a a natural evolutionary process occurring which is moving us in that direction you know i think over the last few centuries the last few hundred years that's led to uh, an intensification of consciousness an expansion of consciousness it's led to increasing empathy increasing connection between people and over the last hundred years, it's become very pronounced in certain parts of the world, especially in the realms of self-development and spiritual development. You know, it's all um, a it's a, an evolutionary process which is moving towards a transcendence of separateness and in, an increasing sense of connection between human beings. But whether that can happen fast enough to to enable us to overcome our present difficulties is, is, is debatable. You know, it's happening, still happening fairly slowly. So we do need to make a conscious attempt as well 
to intensify that process. I think if we make our individual conscious attempts to intensify our own consciousness through self-development, spiritual development, then that will build up a certain, a certain power, a certain intensity, which will spread towards other people. Um, both, I mean, one of the things about enlightenment or spiritual development is that it's contagious. You know, everybody, it's well known that people who become enlightened or awakened, whatever you want to call it, it spreads to the people around them. They have, they have a certain radiance or power which spreads to the people in their vicinity so that the people around them also uh, gain a glimpse of awakening. And therefore, it, it can spread. It can spread on a person to person basis. It can also spread on an unconscious basis through our collective shared consciousness as a species. Yes, and I think it's it's also important to remember that if we just uh, get our information from the mainstream and the mainstream media, that we are getting yes, we're in a lot of trouble, but we are getting a, a distorted view of what what's happening, you know, globally and what other what people are doing. You know, that famous I think there is actually a channel now called Good News, but we just tend to get the condensed bad news and a very narrow picture of it at that. Um, for example, you go online, I think the internet has been a great physical manifestation of this gathering sort of consciousness, but you go online and you go looking and you find so much good happening and so many people trying so hard to achieve these things. And by and large, people don't have websites going, let's have another war dot com, let's kill people dot com. And for where you find that stuff tends to be in the mainstream media and on political yeah, websites yeah. and what have you. So, you know, the, the, there's more encouragement out there. Yes. We, we, you know, we are up against it, but there's a lot of encouraging stuff happening out there. Yeah, I think in a strange way, the mainstream media seems to be a reflection of the human mind in the sense that many people seem to naturally tend to focus on negative thoughts rather than positive thoughts. You know, people tend to ruminate about problems in the future, potential problems in the future, but they tend to dwell on difficult issues from the past, feelings of guilt, feelings of bitterness. And, you know, the mainstream media do the same. They dwell on negative things. You know, in theory, there are lots of positive things we could focus on. Even as an individual, there are lots of positive thoughts we could focus on. We could focus on, you know, the uh, we could appreciate the fact that we're alive when we may not be alive. We could have died at any point. We could die tomorrow, yesterday. You know, we may not have ever been born in the first place. We're only here for a certain amount of time. So you could focus on the positive aspects of that. You could focus on the, the positive aspects of the, the beautiful world around us you know the amazing changes and sights in, in the natural world but you know we, t we do tend to ruminate on negative things and the mainstream media seems to take a similar attitude yeah the this tendency towards negativity is one of my bugbears in the, and i find myself doing it sometimes i think it seems to be almost natural for us that something really good can happen in a day maybe just a little thing not like winning the lottery but you know, somebody else can smile at you or you see some a particularly beautiful scene or just something, a little nice thing happens to you and you appreciate it for a, a passing second. And then an equally sort of on the same sort of scale negative thing happens and you think about it all day. You lie awake at night thinking about it and yeah. it's out of proportion. But we seem to do that to the negative things. We, we give we award all this power to the negative things and we don't give so much. We should dwell more on the positive things that do happen. Yeah, that's true. I was thinking about that. I was thinking of formulating a, a law recently, a psychological law, um, which explains why negative events affect us much more than the correspondingly positive events. So that, for example, if you become ill and lose your health for a while, you know, it can, you know, it can affect you very negatively. You become quite depressed, quite anxious. But then you return to health and for a, for a short time you think, brilliant, it's fantastic, I'm healthy again. But it, it seems to be very short lived. And you compare that to the negative effects of actually being ill, it's much less significant. So I think it's true that negative events affect us much more powerfully than the corresponding positive events. The basic problem there is, I think the, the, the atmosphere of our minds is charged with a, a certain negativity because of our sense of separation, the sense of ego separation. The ego separation creates a basic sense of anxiety which charges the atmosphere of our minds with a certain negativity. And therefore... When we ruminate, when we think, that our thoughts are charged with this negative atmosphere, so therefore they tend, they veer towards, you know, um, potential problems and potential worries. But I think it's possible for us to reprogram 
reprogram our minds, you know, to to foster much more positive habitual thought patterns. Well, in closing, Steve, um, you've said you've written in the fall a, you know, a great deal about the origins of um, humankind as we are today, how, what, how we used to be and how we potentially got here where we are. And we are identified increasingly that what we're doing in the world here collectively and individually is not working. It doesn't seem to be our reason. So in all of your work so far, have you come to any, not conclusions, but any, going to crystallize any thoughts about, is there actually a purpose then to our existence? If we're not born to buy and, and just to shop and then keel over dead, uh, is there actually, what was it? Basically, what's the meaning of life, Steve? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll do my best to answer that question. Uh, uh, well, I think the meaning of life is, or the purpose of life is too big for us to be aware of. But we can we can glimpse it by following it, by following our own impulses. And for me, I think fundamentally the purpose of life is evolution. And that, that means the evolution of our species. It also means the evolution of our own beings, our own selves. So I think we need to, the purpose of life or the meaning of life, if you like, is to follow our own in, individual evolutionary impulse and you know for, for every person that may be different you know you can always sense when you're doing that i can sense when i'm doing that because i know that what i'm doing feels completely natural feels completely right i know i'm, I'm following the right path there's a marvelous sense of being carried along it's like being you know being carried along by a river you know that you're traveling in the right direction there's a marvelous sense of flow which carries you along and that's the evolutionary impulse manifesting itself manifesting itself in our own lives but fundamentally we're we're part of a species and i believe that as a species just just like any species throughout history from the beginning beginnings beginnings of life until now we're all part of this evolutionary current which is heading towards an intensified consciousness an expanded consciousness and increasing awareness of reality and you know we're part of that flow we're moving forward with that flow it's manifesting itself in us and it's manifesting itself in our whole species. And by following that individually, we help our whole species to evolve to, you know, to, towards intensified consciousness. So for me, that is the, the purpose of our lives. Well, Steve, thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you, Greg. That was great. I enjoyed it. Well, that's it for another week. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please check out the website where you'll find an archive of programs on many equally fascinating topics. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.